<laughs> so whenever hurtful policies and attitudes are going on, we as Christians are called to not stay neutral. So the purpose of this series is to motivate each of us to shine a light on racial realities and how activist people of faith are responding. Give us some good ideas. Each Sunday through August 8th, an influential guest leader will talk about the struggles and advances that they see happening. Today, we are honored to hear from an exceptionally passionate and effective change maker who is addressing justice issues on the local, national, and international front. The Reverend Dr. Susan Henry Crow is the General Secretary of the General Board of Church and Society of the entire United Methodist Church, based in Washington, D.C. She has served as this agency's top executive since 2014, after 22 years as Dean of Chapel and Religious Life at Emory University. She's still a member of our own South Carolina Annual Conference, where she pastored four churches, and was the director of the Conference Council on Ministries. So we proudly claim her as our own. Thank you so much, Susan, for speaking to us today about how racial injustices are being addressed by the United Methodist Church in the United States and around the world. And Ruth Ann here from our Standing United Methodist Church and Society Committee is on hand to help moderate and field questions Whenever you give her the word, Susan, she'll do whatever you say. So welcome, <laughs> and we're ready for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne. <clears throat> Can you all hear me? It really is an honor to be with you. I am a child of South Carolina, and um, my years in Columbia were some of really the happiest years of my life, and I feel so connected to the people in Columbia. So it's an honor to be with you and it, it feels like home. So uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I wanna give you just a little background about uh, the work of GBCS, just to put it a little bit in context. Um, G there are 13 agencies in the United Methodist Church and I know that you're familiar with them, but I'm not gonna name them all, but certainly West Path, which is the pension board, the board of discipleship, the board of global ministries, and many others. Uh, the commission on the status and role of women, the commission on religion and race, and the general board of church and society. You as United Methodists support this work and the way that you do it is through your world service giving. So GBCS receives about a million and a half dollars a year from world service now. I'm not getting into all of that. Uh, it's fairly complicated, but uh, you helped fund the work that we do. And we try to be faithful uh, to what the church has asked us to do. Leanne, I mean, Ruth Ann, if you would go to the homepage, uh, I want you all to see this and maybe write it down or keep it uh, because I'll be referring it back to it and have some asks for you. This is our website and it's www.umcjustice.org. And this is a picture of the sign in front of the building. Uh, this happened to be the welcome sign to the 117th uh, Congress, which came into office in January. And that <laughs> was its own drama, which we can talk about if you want to. Uh, the building is at 100 Maryland Avenue in Washington, DC. It sits right beside the Supreme Court and across the street from uh, the Capitol. We also have an office at uh, the Church Center at the United Nations in New York. And I wanna say a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but this is where I work. And this is where um, you are represented in the work of the United Methodist Church on Capitol Hill. Okay, Leah, uh, Ruvan, you can go back um, <laughs> to me. Um, 
there are two things that guide our work. Sometimes people don't really understand how important general conference is, but general conference is the body that sets the work for GBCS and you do it in two ways. One, the general conference establishes and supports the social principles. And as you know, those can change every four years or whenever general conference happens. Uh, so these are the social principles which guide our work. There are about 76 statements in the social principles that say what United Methodists are committed to. The other document, which for those of you who <laughs> like to read about these things, the Book of Resolutions. The Book of Resolutions has about 170 resolutions that were passed by the 2016 General Conference. These resolutions undergird our work and many, many of them are related to anti-racism and anti-colonialism. And we can talk about that if you want to in a little bit, but um, these are the two things that guide our work. I wanna tell you a little bit about how we work. Um, we do two things. Number one, uh, GBCS uses these two documents to influence Congress and the United Nations other seats of power as they work on legislation, regulation, and executive orders. We work at the national level. So what is happening in Congress, we are weighing in on with our ecumenical partners on what the United Methodists have said we want to do. This very week, we're working on voting rights and passing the voting rights um, the John Lewis voting rights is critically, critically important because 27 states have already tried to roll back um, and create an environment of suppression of voting. And we are advocating at the national level on supporting open, free and fair elections. So that's one example of what we are doing right now in terms of policy and legislation on Capitol Hill. The second thing that we do is educate United Methodists about what is happening at the national and international level and help people know what actions to take. So if we were to go back to the main page of uh, umcjustice.org, there is a column that says, what can you do? If you click on to that, it says, this is what we need you to do now. Um, so what we care about and what you can do, and these are the items on advocacy that we need United Methodists to take action on. So we understand our job is to transform the world for Jesus Christ and putting our faith into action is critically important. So we have an outward facing ministry into the world and we have an at home ministry, which is educating and cultivating action in the church. We have five priorities right now. And those five priorities um, are peace, poverty, immigration, health, and climate through a racial lens. Uh, thank you, Ruth. And these are the priorities about uh, learn what uh, United Methodists can do now. So on the issues of climate, health, immigration, peace, poverty through a racial lens is how we are working in these particular days. As I've said, voting rights uh, is really important. Also HR 40, which is uh, the call for a commission to study and develop uh, reparations proposals. HR 40 uh, is uh, being debated and uh, worked on at the moment. So we are supporting both of those things. Um, one of the specific actions that you could take, uh, let me say one other thing, which has racial implications, as you all know. Um, 
we are promoting providing COVID-19 for international assistance. Many of you know that the vaccine has been pretty available in the United States, but it is not nearly as available or accessible in many parts of the world. Uh, I was on a call the other day trying to fix my Comcast. Um, and I happened to be talking to a young man and he asked me if I'd had the vaccine. And I said, yes, I have. And he, I said, where are you and have you had it? And he said, well, I am in Manila, Philippines and I can't get it. And I said, what's the situation there? And he said, well, at the moment it costs a thousand dollars and most people can't afford that. So we are working uh, to make COVID accessible uh, both in the United States, encouraging people in the United States to have the vaccine, but also make it accessible around the world. Um, so that's another example of what we're doing. Back to the Voting Rights Act, um, because this has direct implications for the racial realities in um, the, both the church and the world in the United States. Um, as we work on voting rights, one of the things that you can do is to call your senators and say, we want you to vote for the Voting Rights Act. Call your congressional delegation and say, we support the Voting Rights Act. Um, I had a meeting uh, in DC a couple of weeks ago with a minister friend from South Carolina. And I said to him, it would be really helpful if you would be in touch with Lindsey Graham and Tim Scott, because they need to know that the people who are called United Methodists in South Carolina support the Voting Rights Act. Uh, let me turn a little bit, not just to the society, but to the church, um, some of the racial realities in the church. Um, racism is, an issue that has plagued the church since the beginning of time. Uh, you know that John Wesley was opposed to slavery, but somehow uh, the people called Methodists were conflicted about it from the very beginning. And we participated in slavery um, from the very beginning. And of course the church divided over the issue of slavery. Uh, the issues of slavery and racism still uh, confound us and we are not free from them, both systemically um, and in our churches. Um, the United Methodist Church is 92% white and South Carolina has the largest African-American Methodist population in the entire connection. And that is the reason, there are a few others, but that is the principal reason that I left my and wanted my conference membership to remain in South Carolina. Because South Carolina represents the best of the church in terms of trying to work toward racial equality and justice. It is not perfect. Uh, it does not succeed all the time. But there has been a lifetime, certainly in my lifetime, commitment to working for racial justice in South Carolina. Uh, the boards and agencies have their own um, commitments to anti-racism in GBCS. We have the staff working in two ways. We're working on one, the definition of what is anti-racism. Uh, there are lots of definitions and there are lots of approaches but we felt like that we needed to have a common um, understanding of the terms of what is anti-racism. And internally, we're also working on how do we align our programmatic work in terms of exhibiting uh, behaviors and commitments that express anti-racism. And you all know how to do this. I mean, I'm not talking to a group that lives in uh, other parts of the country that don't get this, but if there is a presentation with our UN seminar, we want several voices at that table. We do not just want white people talking. So if we're talking about anything, we want perspectives and voices from across the church. We've just done two um, 
webinars and one is on Tuesday on, uh, on oh, it's on Monday at one o'clock on reparations. Um, I would urge you to take a look at the first one. It's on YouTube. Um, it's UMC um, Reparations, Board of Church and Society. And in that uh, webinar, we had someone from Hawaii who talked about uh, how racism had, and colonialism had manifest itself in Hawaii. We had someone who was Japanese American, someone who was African American, and someone who was Native American. Uh, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging on our work, but it is one of the most educational pieces, and I learned a great deal myself. So I would really commend that to you, and then um, we'll have a live webinar on Monday at one o'clock on reparations. But the church has to continue to feel um, committed to the conversations on um, anti-racism and how we commit our lives and our institutions to more um, racially just systems. Uh, I'll just say a couple more things and then I'll open uh, this up for conversation. A few of the things that are really concerning right now, um, and as the general secretary, I have been very fortunate in the past month, um, well months, to serve on two committees. One was on a committee that is look, it's a United Nations committee that's looking at human rights violations in the Philippines. Uh, we've had hours and hours of testimonies from educators, church leaders, lawyers, and the situation of red tagging, which is calling groups and people communist and then arresting them um, and not giving them fair process has created a lot of human rights violations in the Philippines. Because we were the colonizers, or one in one part of history, we were the colonizers of the Philippines. We do have responsibility for trying to ensure um, not only free and fair elections, but um, prohibiting human rights violations. So that's one thing that I have worked on internationally. The other committee is with the World Council of Churches. And we have worked uh, this spring on testimonies of native uh, and indigenous peoples in North America. I was very privileged to be part of testimonies in Winnipeg and for, I guess, four days, we heard testimonies from um, indigenous communities on three topics. One was on racism, one was on missing and murdered girls and women, and the other was on homelessness. Uh, the situation in North America, uh, both in Canada and the United States is somewhat different. And during those testimonies was the time when the residential schools report was released. And so it was an extremely painful week uh, as we really heard from the native communities in Canada and all of the fallout from uh, the finding the children's bodies. So that's another thing that I have been part of. I was, I'm working on which you'll see um, on a statement that will come out from the desk of, which from the desk of Susan Henry Crow this week on voting rights um, in honor of John Lewis. And I was working on that statement on um, Friday. <laughs> and in the evening, you know that um, the news came from the Texas federal judge about DACA. And so I knew that next, this coming week, we'll have to be working on voting rights and we'll have to be responding to uh, that decision by the federal judge in Texas. So it's pretty fast paced world. There's a lot to respond to. I like it better uh, when we are initiating and being proactive, uh, which I would call this Sunday school class <laughs> uh, as a moment of being active and um, creative rather than reactive, but I know that much of my week this week will be reacting to certain things that have happened. Uh, I did ask Marvin at the beginning of this, what's happening in Columbia. Um, I am spending some of my time in Atlanta and the majority of my time in DC, but the gun violence uh, 
and it's episodic. It's not organized gun violence, but the incidence of gun violence this year um, in the many cities around the country has been extremely high. The church's position, of course, is that we oppose uh, the sale of unregistered guns um, and that we have advocated for the registration of guns and the control. Uh, that gets us nowhere very fast. But with the rise of so much gun violence, we will have to be back on that very soon. So those are uh, some updates on what I am doing and what we're working on and trying to represent what United Methodists are committed to. So I welcome your um, comments and your questions and reflections. All right, so to get our um, question session started, I'm gonna be moderating both the questions coming from this room and the questions coming in from the chat. So if you're watching from the Zoom link, if you wanna type a question into the chat, only me and Susan will be able to see it. Once it comes in, I'll kind of pick between the room and the chat. If it's on chat, I'm gonna read it out loud. If it's in the room, once you guys say it, I'm going to say it again so that people on Zoom can hear it. So if you'll just give me a second to repeat that before you start answering it. So with that, we'll go ahead and open the floor. David. So what, what kind of response did you get from our legislators in South Carolina from, from your efforts to, to uh, influence their decisions? All right, so the question is, what kind of response do we get from the South Carolina legislators to the efforts to influence their decisions? It's mixed, uh, of course. Um, and sometimes it's unusual. Um, there are um, both legislators um, and senators from South Carolina that are supportive of things and not supportive of things. When we have Hill meetings, and of course for the past year and a half, they've been on Zoom, uh, we always say, or I always say, you know, we're representing 7 million United Methodists in the United States and 250,000 in South Carolina. Um, that does not mean, uh, and I'm clear about this, that every person who's United Methodist in South Carolina is in agreement, uh, but that this is the church's position on various uh, items. I do think on issues of um, child um, care, on Medicare, on Medicaid, on health, there is some support in South Carolina. Um, I think issues like climate are more complicated in South Carolina and certainly with as many um, as much money that comes into South Carolina for military it's it's complicated, but um, some of the senators have uh, been more supportive on racial issues some not so much uh, mm -hmm. and sometimes people change actually. Uh, both ways. <laughs> they may be supportive and then as negotiations take place, they, you know, will tweak it and then either come out and be supportive or not. Um, I don't know on voting rights. Uh, I've not had that conversation, so I'm not sure where they are right this minute on the specifics of that. We're working very closely with uh, West Virginia and Arizona at the moment. Um, so I don't know what the conversations in South Carolina have been, um, but we are targeting the key states uh, where the votes are critically important right now. The, both the Congress and the Senate is very divided. Uh, it's just about straight down party lines. And so getting movement is pretty hard. Um, and that's where you come in because I think the more pressure uh, they get from their constituents, it's really important to help them moderate their positions. They're not gonna change 180 degrees, but if they can moderate a position or tweak something, uh, it makes a big difference. All right, we have some questions coming in on the chat. Um, so here's one. I'm encouraged to learn about the strong justice platforms of the big UMC. How can we get more involved at the local level where it candidly feels like the politics drive the other way? <laughs> I hear you. Um, I think 
things like this are really important. I think for Sunday school classes, for um, churches, for pastors, one of the most disappointing things that I have had to face at GBCS is how few people know about the social principles. I know that the people on this call know about the social principles because I know your church and I know the ways in which the leadership of the church has supported the social principles. But across the connection, we have people come to DC for seminars and other Hill visits that say, we never heard of the social principles. And I think just helping at the conference level and at the local church level, people to understand what the social principles are and how they work is critically important. On YouTube, we have um, six little videos that explain the social principles that any Sunday school class could watch. They're about 30 minutes, uh, or the long ones are 40 minutes. The short ones are shorter than that, like five minutes. Um, but it takes some of the specific social principles and articulates uh, what we as United Methodists passed by the General Conference say on various things. So I think district superintendents can help. I think encouraging pastors to talk about the social principles in sermons. Um, and I was a pastor, you know, I served churches and I did not beat the <laughs> congregations up with social principles every week. But I would say if I was preaching on blessed are the peacemakers, <laughs> this is what we say about peace. Um, in those days, I was not preaching on climate uh, in the same way that we would today, but you've just seen what's happened in Germany. Um, now there are fires in Russia, I saw this morning, uh, and certainly in the West of the United States. And so the ways in which um, we must begin to address climate issues is really critically important and affects everybody's life. Um, so I think education and preaching and teaching is really important. And maybe even collaborations with like your church um, committee on church and society with some other churches, um, church and society committees as well. How do we go from the very broad statements and social principles to develop a position the church has on the narrow issues like whether a particular building on the issue should be approved? Is there a is there a person that makes that decision of hey here's how we're going to apply social principles to this bill and take a position on it, or is that something that maybe decides as to how we apply the law social principles to a narrow question? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, I will, just a second. So the question is, how do we uh, go from the broad principles of the social principles down to the specifics of a particular bill? Is there a person or a committee that decides that, or what's the particulars of how that goes? Within GBCS or within a church? Within GBCS. Within GBCS. Uh, we have ways of tracking uh, all the things that are happening in Congress. So there's a thing called the congressional record. And so we're tracking what's going on. So this week we know that voting rights is, is coming up. Also uh, the federal budget is coming up. And so we're paying, the staff is paying attention to all of this. We have 17 um, staff members two people work at the United Nations and the rest work in DC. So our advocacy team is tracking what is happening and we can't do everything. So those five areas that I spoke of, peace, poverty, health, immigration, and climate, uh, we're looking at those things particularly. We don't do things, even though we wish we could, but one of the things we don't work on, for example, is education. Education belongs to the state level. And so we don't have the capacity uh, to really deal with education, even though we wish we did. Uh, but those top priorities um, and, the, and the federal budget, one of the things that will um, 
a group is asking us to support is not funding military aid to the Philippines until they quit um, their human rights violations. Now, <laughs> that's not gonna happen, but we will talk to them about that and say, we want the US, uh, we want Congress to defund uh, military aid to the Philippines until they um, abolish their human rights violations. They will hear from a lot of people in the US, from California, from Hawaii, maybe some from South Carolina, some from New York, some from other places, um, because there are many, many people from the Philippines in the US. They'll hear from a lot of people. Uh, the chance that that'll happen is not very great, but it will put pressure on them. So we follow the congressional record. We internally are working and then we have our communications people that are posting on our website, take action now. So that's a little bit of how that cycle goes. Real quick follow up. So, you know, social principles may say, you know, we're in favor of voting rights. You know, we think everybody should vote. That's not too controversial. But then you get a particular bill that says, here's how we're going to make sure that everybody can vote. Who decides, yeah, this bill is consistent with social principles and we need to call our Congress people and try to advocate for the bill, or hey, this, this bill is not consistent with social principles and we need to we need to oppose. Who, who decides sort of on a specific level what we oppose or what we oppose or what we Okay, so the follow up to that is to take it more specific. If we have like the social principle that we support voting rights, that's not very controversial. But then when it gets down to a particular voting rights bill, who decides this bill is in line with the social principle of supporting voting rights and that this is one we're going to promote for people to call their congressmen on? That's a great question. Uh, generally, it's the advocacy staff. Uh, they have a lot of expertise on the details of a bill. And so they and our conversations with our ecumenical partners, and occasionally I weigh in on it, but it is internal to us, kind of a grassroots effort <coughs> of saying, this is clearly something the United Methodist Church would support uh, in coalition with Presbyterians, Lutherans, Catholics. We also are committed to this. So if we have a sign on letter, uh, we don't do it by ourselves. We do it with maybe 20 other faith communities because that's when it starts to make a difference. If we have a, a sign on letter um, that we can commit ourselves to and that other faith communities do, then it carries more weight. There, um, you know, it's always having to navigate a little bit because there are bills that would be somewhat consistent with what United Methodists say, but might go too far or might not go far enough. And then what your question is, it's a judgment call. How far can we go? Um, or does it really, really not go far enough? Sometimes we're silent on things uh, for various reasons. Like it's just, it's too weak. It doesn't really represent what our deeper commitment is on something. Um, and so it, it's a judgment call from at times. But I would say most of the time it's pretty clear, uh, but as you know, and I can tell from the question that there are always nuances in bills that you, know, you hold your nose and sign on or you <laughs> just don't sign on or you sign on and say, I wish this could be better. Um, so we supported the Iran agreement. We have continued to support that agreement because we believe that peace in the Middle East is really important. Um, there were things in that that we did not totally agree with, but we were not too, it was not too far. Um, for us to not agree to sign on. Um, so there are always negotiations at some level on, on many, if not most of these, this legislation. Also just a word on executive orders. 
Uh, the president, of course, as you know, has power to sign executive orders. Um, we do support those uh, from time to time and we reject those from time to time. So sometimes we might say we um, do not support the president signing this executive order or we do support this. So I have been pretty clear as the general secretary that it, what we support has to be within the bounds of the social principles and or a resolution and have tried to stay faithful to that, which means that at times we've supported things that I personally may or may not have agreed with, um, but I have tried to keep us faithful to what the general conference has asked us to do. We have another uh, question from the chat, then I'll get to you, Marvin. Um, what is the church's position on critical race theory? <laughs> church does not have a position on critical race theory. Uh, we have positions on racism. We have um, positions on freedom of thought and freedom of conscience. And we have a variety of positions on issues that would be part of the conversation and the debate on critical race theory. Uh, we all know that history uh, is a very complicated thing. And the more honest and authentic history can be, the better. Um, but there are always the question of who's history and who's writing the history. I am reading a book and I'm gonna write, a, I am writing about this for this voting rights um, piece that I'm doing. Carl Jaspers was a German theologian from 19, 1930 to 1969, I believe. And he wrote a book on um, German guilt. And the construct is really, really important. And so I'm using that to talk about um, as, as, sort of as it relates to reparations, but what is our responsibility? And one of the points is, what is truth? Um, so if you are Native American and <laughs> You have heard forever that October the 11th is Columbus Day. And that's really not the true history for the Native American community. You don't really wanna celebrate Columbus Day because it does not mean the same thing to the Native American community that it might mean to an Anglo community. There's a lot of naivete. There's a lot of not knowing. Uh, about issues like that, but <clears throat> truth becomes a really important matter. So the church does not have a position and we could not have a position on critical race theory until the general conference meets. And I doubt that it would come in that form, um, that it would be a compilation of other positions that we have. Um, throughout the book that would be integrated and in, perhaps into a resolution. All right, Murphy. Um, how often does the board of a church and society meet and to what degree uh, are decisions made by the board and the staff? I'm sure that day to day it has to be staff. I'd like to understand a little better the dynamics between those two. Okay. Um, the question is, how often does the board of church and society meet? Um, how often are they making decisions? Day to day, we're sure it's the staff, but just wanting to understand the relationship between the decisions made by the board and by the individual staff. Mm -hmm. uh, the board, by bylaws, has to meet twice a year. Uh, and so we have, and the board members serve for a four year term with some eligible to serve for more years. Um, we are now, the, the board members that were elected in 20, some of the board members are now in their ninth year. Uh, because of COVID, we've not been able to meet in person. And because General Conference didn't meet, they are serving a year beyond what they were elected to serve. Um, the board has oversight of the issues of, uh, church and society. And there's a great working relationship between the board and the staff. 
We are the ones that are in the details and keep the board apprised of what is happening on the Hill or what is happening at the United Nations. Uh, there really is not, there's not been conflict between the board and the staff um, on, on uh, the whole variety of issues. Um, I think because we have been really clear what undergirds the work, the social principles and the resolutions undergird the work of the whole church. And I think that's been a clarifying um, position for the board. Um, so for example, on the issue of LGBTQ rights, you know that the position of the church is very good on non-discrimination in the secular world. There is no question in the social principles about LGBTQ rights, both on discrimination, on non-discrimination and access. The problem on LGBTQ now is only on the ministry side and the paragraphs in the discipline that say people who are LGBTQ and in relationship cannot be ordained nor can clergy do services. We're good on all the human rights side of that. It's the church side of that that is the problem. Our board, for example, is made up of 62 people. We do have legislation cutting the size of the board to 32, um, but we can't do that until general conference meets. I would say on all of the issues on which I've spoken, the board is supportive. And it is not homogenous. <laughs> Any board has, you know, 62 different opinions. Um, and so not every person agrees on everything. So if there is discussion about certain issues like human sexuality, it would not be unanimous. But we have presented to the general conference revised social principles, and that's also on our website. It's not the red book, which is what we're operating with now, but hold on. it's the blue book, which are the proposed uh, social principle changes. The statement on uh, human sexuality is a broader statement and was worked out with 62 people from around the world. So <clears throat> when that passes, hopefully, at the general conference, there is a latitude of uh, to be more open on issues of human sexuality. That's just an example. So it's a, Robin's question is a great question. Uh, and I hope I've answered that. All right, um, well, I see there's maybe one more question, but you've kind of addressed it. We are at 1045 though. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this out. Um, thank you so much for speaking with us today and for answering all these questions. Um, I'm gonna invite the rest of you to please come back next week for our next series, which will be um, Reverend Charles Johnson from the South Carolina Conference, uh, who will be talking about the um, particular ways the South Carolina UMC is engaging with racial issues. Be at the same time, same place. You can also register for the Zoom link if you like. Um, Susan, we did have a couple of questions. If we could get some contact information for you. Sure. Uh, yeah, do you have an email address that people could write to you at? Yes, let me put it in the chat. Fantastic. Um, I would love that. Um, I'll, I can read it out for those of us who are here. If you want to write it down, I'm not sure the best way to do that. It's going to be easy. Uh, this is it. All right. shenrycrow at umcjustice.org. And there's an E on crow. Yeah, I won't put it if that's not there. At umcjustice. Umcjustice.org. Everything we have is umcjustice.org. You can also get all of our information sent to you or what parts of it you want, but you have to sign up. I can't take the list of the Sunday school class and just send it out to everybody. Uh, you have to request it. Awesome. And is that on the same website that we were showing folks earlier? Yes. Great. All righty. Thank you, Susan. Thank you so much. <laughs>
I think we can go ahead and let you go. Thanks, folks at home for joining us via Zoom. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Have a great Bye. afternoon.